Ladies and gentlemen, the Company of Heroes 2 pre-alpha has just gone live. And here today, to talk about our experiences playing the multiplayer last Thursday, it's Tommy, Sefa, Razor, and Helping Hands. What's up, Razor? You're at the top of my screen here, sitting up in that webcam. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good, Tommy. I just signed in for the beta myself, got my key, downloading it on Steam as we speak. Uh, and I think we're going to have about an hour's discussion now about uh, our experience playing it already. That's right. What about you, Sefa? What are you thinking? You just you just got your Steam beta key. Does that not just 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 make you feel all tingly inside? Yeah, same as George. I'm gonna be after having to multitask, talking to you guys on cam and playing company affairs at the same time. <laughs> it's gonna be fun. Hands, <laughs> are you? How how are you on the multitasking? Are you gonna be? Are you gonna be with us, or are you literally just, um, just gonna be I'll jumping in? I'll try my in? best. Yeah. I think. I I help. I've almost finished installing it now at 12 what, 12 megabytes a second. It's real good. I was in the I'm in the rather difficult position of having to having to send this broadcast and therefore not having the bandwidth available to actually download the game. So I'll have to do that after we're done. But uh, yeah, as we said, we're going to be talking for about an hour about uh, the multiplayer that we played. We're in a London event last Thursday. We got four hours of hands-on time with what is probably going to be a very similar build to what has been released publicly today. So. I think without much further ado we should uh we should jump into things and uh and take a look at the kind of stuff that we are going to be uh going to be talking about. So, let's I mean there's so much stuff to cover and I know that there's a lot of people out there who have not yet played COH2 at all. So we will try and bear in mind for you know because obviously us greedy bastards we've already been playing it for plenty of times not only at uh, this event on Thursday but at Eurogamer as well. So, Let's talk first about maps. The maps that we have played so far, the map layout, the resource system. One of the more bigger sort of points of contention when Ami first played it and gave us his the first little taste of of COH2 all the way those those few months ago. So um, so let's start again. Let's start at the top. Razor, what do you make of the maps and resource layout in so CO2 so far? Um, we haven't seen that many maps yet. Um. So it's difficult to say about the maps. The maps we have seen have mostly been to demonstrate the new features like cold tech, the movement of infantry. Uh, the key thing really that we saw that's different to the pre-alpha build, different to anything you guys have heard before, is the new resource system. A new resource system, basically strap points now give all income. They give three income to munitions, three income to fuel, and a manpower income. There are no longer high points, medium points, low points. Everything gives all resources, um, and that's an interesting dynamic, uh, certainly. It doesn't sound like it would work that well, but uh, playing it isn't as retarded as it first seems. So, Sefa, what, what do you think, how do you think that's going to influence, I mean, there's going to be a kind of a very early form of, of metagame developing here. How do you think that's actually going to change things from, from what we're used to in COH? I think it'll... Um... It'll calm things out a bit more. Like you won't be rushing for massive munitions and fuel points. There'll be less map imbalance because all the strategic points around the game are going to give you fuel and munitions. Weren't there points that gave more munitions or fuel? There were there were <coughs> there specialized some. points. Yeah, there, it consisted mm. of a series of kind of neutral strategic points with the occasional real fuel point or real munitions point. And um, yeah, it was it was interesting um, the way they had that. I mean, Hans, what did you think? I mean, and, and talk a little bit about cutoffs. Uh, that's that's one thing that really defines COH gameplay is the cutoff play. So, what did you notice about that? There wasn't really many cutoffs, to be honest. They were, everything seemed quite connected, and um, there weren't as many points in general in this time round. So, and I think it's going to encourage more passive play. More passive play. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah I mean. It's it's an interesting system, and of course there's there's that kind of strange uh, observation post system as well, where you can opt to build the equivalent of OPs on on any of these strategic points to turn them into a into a proper munitions point or a proper fuel point. 
but I don't think in any of our games we actually needed to. I think we might have done it, you know, just for kicks, but you know, none of us were really were really lacking in resources. So maybe that's that you know, that's something that we'll have to uh to to bear in mind. But as far as as far as maps go, what what are that the actual the um uh, the the aesthetics of it, uh, Razor. What did you make of the sort of how they looked? But um, you know, we can talk about graphics as well a little bit. I mean, the, the version we played was in DX11. Yeah, I mean, I'm well known as someone that doesn't care about graphics. Play on the lowest possible settings on pretty much every game. But my God, it looked beautiful. It really did. The setting was just amazing. The snow, the infantry crawling through it, the Katusha rockets, the ice cracking. Everything looked fucking awesome. Um, I have to disagree a little bit with hands about passive gameplay. Uh, I think that every point giving resources won't necessarily mean passive gameplay because every point will have an equal weight rather than having, let's say, a Vermatch player who can camp in a corner of the map or a British player who can camp in a corner of the map on just a few high points. I think if you have a dominant map control, if you've got two thirds map control, that's such a big swing in your favor that uh, all points will be contested more now, I think, rather than it being more passive. Okay, and that brings us on, of course, to, to cold tech, which, I mean, at least from my point of view, it seemed that when there were blizzards and stuff in effect, it did tend to kind of slow the game down a bit. What did you think about that, Seth? Cold tech, well, yeah, we had a bit of um, disagreement with the cold tech. It seems to slow things down. It will make uh, artillery better since you're going to have to clump your units up. You either have the option of staying on the front line, clumping your units up in this small a area and dying to artillery or retreating everything back to the base. Maybe shred things out, um, go into buildings, but I don't really like it at its current stage. And coming back to the maps, I will say one thing about the maps is that they seem to, they seem to have got it with the maps. They seem to be more balanced now. Like, the two maps that we played on, the cold map, it looked nice and spread out. It was similar to Semois and, and Langres. And I think the other map was as well, the 1v1 map. So it's not like they're doing anything crazy anymore with the map play, especially the 1v1 maps. I think most 1v1 maps are going to be symmetrical. They're going to have a couple of munitions points and fuel points, but they're going to be a lot more balanced than... Well, they aren't going to be just free maps that everyone uses, like there was in the first Company of Heroes. They could possibly be up to five and six maps if they keep sticking with the same design. Okay, so you you like the design of the maps. I mean, we we of course we played one v ones on a two v two map, and we played two v twos on I think a four v four map. I mean, what did you make of them, Hans? You know, in terms of what they felt like balance-wise. I mean, I know they weren't quite fully featured. There was one where there was a bridge which you couldn't cross. Yeah. But um, but uh, that aside, what did you make of, of the balance from you know from the little that we did get to play? Well, the only two versus two map we did play was like a a choke point map with bridges and cutoffs, not like the or like a big Duclair map. So it felt like playing via River Valley, and therefore we didn't get a whole a good sense of what a two uh, the balance of a two versus two map in Vico, like a Vico map. So I'm not in t we need to see a proper 2 versus 2 map before we can kind of make a decision on that, to be honest. Okay, so let's let's go back and, think and talk a little bit about cold tech. Um, so there's, so in the game, so people know roughly what cold tech is, it brings about blizzards and it brings about snow and ice, things that can fall through the ice, um, and units can die of the cold. So, Razor, what did you think about the whole cold mechanic, and how were you how are you getting around that in your games that you played? Um, it seemed like it had been toned down from the previous build we played, to be perfectly honest with you. It didn't have as big an impact. I didn't find myself walking the squad off to one corner of the map, and by the time they'd capped the point, they were down to one man, and that one man was freezing to death and lying on the floor groaning, and I lost a whole squad. Uh, it seems to, It's definitely been toned down. It seems more reasonable now something that's much easier to react to uh, and deal with. I still think on winter maps, extreme temperatures is going to be a big issue. Uh, infantry have to be in cover pretty much all the time, or you have to have them staging between houses to cover to a half track, something like that. Um, the blizzards, I didn't feel they had that much of an impact, but I know that Sefer was playing and he got into a big fight with, I think it was you, Tommy, 
He was fighting a big infantry engagement. He said, I lost more men to the blizzard than I did to his units. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. And I know in terms of the, the fragile ice, Hans has definitely got, uh, got a bit <laughs> of a gripe with that. Oh, uh, yes. I lost a, one of the best. Can we talk about the tank now? We can, yeah. Yeah. Well, ladies and gentlemen, there is the beast known as the elephant tank. I don't know if you know what that is, but it freaking is... A, it kills everything. It is really good. However, I drove mine onto the ice, and it died so quickly, because Zephyr because destroyed the ice underneath it, and it sank, unfortunately. So it was the most saddest elephant tank ever to hit the eastern front. Oh dear, oh dear. <laughs> now, one of the things that people were really interested in, um, having seen sort of a few press leakages recently, is how doctrines are going to work. And this is something that really isn't very clear from some of, of the press releases that have come from people who don't really, you know, who, who haven't played COH at a high level and don't kind of understand the way that doctrines can really impact on a big game. So they're not known as, as doctrines so much, are they? They're known as commanders. So, um, so Seth, what, what did you make of the, of the commander system? Uh... Well, I'm looking at the uh, thing that Quinn Duffy put up on the board now. Seven commanders, 20 abilities per army. You'll be able to choose... As the way I understand it, you'll be able to choose three commanders before the game starts, right? And then you'll be able to choose one of those three commanders once you're in-game. And possibly there's going to be a lot more commanders in the future. Whether they're going to be paid for, you have to pay for a commander... Whether they're going to be completely free, I think you might be, have to pay for some of them. And some of the abilities, like they might be too good, they might be underpowered, um, depending on which commander you choose. It, there's a lot more dynamic to it, but I'm not sure. Like, watch this space. I'm not sure if that's going to be good for the game or bad for the game at the moment. Indeed. So, I mean, Razor, what do you think the, the competitive implications are going to be from this element of predetermination and potentially having doctrines that, that are essentially DLC? Yeah, I mean, this was one of my major questions when I was speaking with uh, Quinn Duffy, who's really the designer on, on COH2. I said, you know, you're going to have seven commanders per faction, and then you're going to say you can choose three of them before going into the game. And these commanders do specialize. Some are infantry specialists, some are armor specialists, some are a combination of the two. They unlock certain units sometimes. They have active and passive abilities, so they kind of complement whatever style you have. And I said, if I want to go with elite infantry spam, and I pick a, a, a commander who is an elite infantry specialist, buffs my infantry, and then I pick a load of other things and just go with elite infantry, and the opponent goes for, I don't know, something that boosts his light vehicles and weapon crews, and my elite infantry just will run all over that with the buffs that they've got. Is the game just predetermined then? Is it not? Um, especially if they start releasing DLC or expansions that increase the number of commanders. If you get a commander that everyone goes, well, this one ability on the commander is so good, I have to get that expansion, or I have to get that DLC to compete, that would be worrying. Um, I like the fact that they're specialized. That's what I like about them. I don't think I like the amount of choice because I think it's gonna, people are going to decide what's the best and pretty much pick that one every time. Um, and I also don't like how it's now a linear. There isn't a choice of two sides of the tech tree like it used to be. It's just straight down the middle. Um, as you get CPs, things are unlocked. You don't, have a, you don't have a choice anymore. They're just unlocked in order. Yeah, that's right, of course, because there's just, yeah, you just have on the side of your screen, you have six abilities, so whereas in, so of course, you know, you have six abilities right now in COH, but they come in two different trees, and you have to make a conscious choice as to whether you take a little bit of both and eventually get your two heavy hitters at the end, or whether you just power through to get that, you know, KT or, or Pershing or, or whatever it is at the end of the tree. So, going to come back uh, to you now, Hans, with... Some, uh, what did you make of the idea of Intel bulletins? Oh, this Intel is a bulletins. relatively new thing that's come you. through and reminds me just just a, just a little bit of Company of Heroes Online. It looks like they've wanted to bring, they've just literally imported it over, but try to disguise it using Intel's. To be honest, I don't, I don't really 
particularly like it because I think you can just buff certain units with it. It's like those little cards that you could use to do plus ten percent of accuracy for your pack guns or plus ten percent or more penetration for them, and that can lead on towards like you have certain armies that are geared to be able to defeat another type of army, and therefore it could be unbalanced in that respect. Um, although I did notice in the lobby you couldn't see each other's Intel cards and stuff like that. So you can keep people, you can do double bluffing and stuff like that because you don't know what your opponent's got and he doesn't know what you've got. So then each game you could, you know, swap it, swap out or uh, your different Intel cards if you'd like. So, so just clear up for people. So th these Intel bulletins they give, they're supposed to give small passive buffs that are constantly active. So, for example, 10% extra penetration on your AT <coughs> guns, or 15% extra accuracy on your on your MG or whatever. How do you actually earn them? Oh, you earn them from I think it's like completing achievements. For example, if you have the different ones for single player and multiplayer, you have ones that so if you kill like ten tiger tanks, I think Quinn said, then you would get your uh, pack guns would be much more um, able to you know what know what they're aiming for, and therefore they have a special they get a special bonus from that, and they, that's how you get the card. You get the ten percent penetration rate because they know what they're shooting at because they've killed loads of tanks before, and that's how you earn it. Okay, so now we talked, you know, about some of the things that we maybe didn't perhaps so much like, but here's one thing that we, that I think we all unanimously said this is just so much better, which is the post-game info, the stats that come up when you finish oh, a yeah. game. Uh, Razor, tell us, tell us about the that post-game info. What kind of stuff can people expect now? Well, I don't know about anyone else, but the post-game in CH1, I think I've pretty much never looked at in my life, and the numbers are irrelevant. You maybe look at kills or friendly fire and go, ah, you killed 16 of my men. But the Sewitch 2 one is awesome that I spent so much time looking at that going, this is amazing. I'm really enjoying looking at this. All this info is fantastic. It had, uh, I think, four tabs. It had uh, personal unit awards where it gave you a little picture of the unit that uh, was your best unit, your most efficient unit, did the most damage, that kind of thing. Breaks down its kills, its efficiency, what did the most damage to, what did the most damage to it, uh, that kind of stuff. A little highlight, uh, a little bit like uh, I think we had the award for the, the best unit in tournaments in, in COH1. Uh, and then you had a breakdown of um, the sort of the, there was a one for build orders with the units when they were built, as they were built in chronological order with timings, similar to you see in a, a post game on StarCraft 2 which could be quite useful for working out if someone's rushing a light vehicle, for example, how quickly can I get the light vehicle out? How quickly can my opponent, having seen it, then respond with an AT gun, something like that? Uh, there was, uh, what was the other one? Uh, do you remember, Joel? Yeah, they had a manpower graph, which would show you how much manpower your whole army is worth, which is like one of the best things ever. You can look at the game after and see where the key battles happened, how much manpower you lost, so you can calculate in future, hmm, I shouldn't do that in future, or maybe I should do that more often in future. You look at how much manpower you lost or, you, or you're gaining in, from each combat and each battle. Uh, so that was a really good post-game um, post thing. Yeah, and the other thing they had was unit efficiency as well. They had uh, a breakdown of every unit you produced and then a sort of a, an analysis of its unit cost ratio to how much damage, how many kills it got on the field. And I thought this was a really interesting thing. I, I don't know if you guys agree, but in terms of an immediate, you can look at post-game analysis, you can go, well, obviously I lost because his, uh, his uh, elephant tank did 9,000% efficiency. It took out all of my tanks. There was my yeah. problem. I needed an AT gun or something. And it also would be interesting in terms of balance. Uh, you can look and say, well, every single game the Soviets have played, conscripts have been the most efficient unit by far and away. They may need looking at in terms of balance because they're way too efficient. I don't know if you agree with that or not, uh, Hans. Yeah, uh, yeah, I agree. Yes. I like the in-game timer as well. They, have, well. they always have that in StarCraft too, so you know exactly what point of the game you're doing certain things, the limits of the other player, what time they're going to get out. Like, if that was in Company of Heroes 1, it would make things a lot more transparent. You'd know exactly when you're, the opponent's going to get an MA out. But on the flip side, um, it might make the game too transparent. <clears throat> like, players before, they needed, you know, they have a current general feeling of how far the opponent's got in the game. 
uh, based on how much fuel, based on how much munitions they've got. So that kind of aspect, you know, that that sense is kind of gone with the in-game timer. So I think it's good, but yeah. So do you think it's a, a payoff between information for the players when compared to um, sort of taking a, a certain inbuilt skill, a certain nous, uh yeah. sort of player? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I'd say that. I can agree with that, yeah. Um, we're going back to Coltec for a second, the Blizzards, one of the major changes they had for Blizzards uh, from the pre-alpha build that we played at Eurogame Expo was there's now a warning. As a visual warning comes up on the screen, Blizzard incoming, and then you get a timer, a big clock in the top corner, and it gives you a chance to prepare for the Blizzard. I don't know how you think this will impact on the game, guys. Do you think this is a good change, a bad change? Uh, I played change. most of my games on Blizzard. Maps, but sorry, you chose Hans to go for us. Hans? <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, I was thinking, yeah, I think it's a really good idea to have the Blizzard because then it gets people prepared and ready for it. So if you were fighting and then the Blizzard suddenly struck, anybody, the person who was attacking at that moment uh, against the defending position, he's caught off guard and all his guys are going to be freezing to death during an, during an attack. So if you've got on a timer, every, both players know when it's going to hit. So then that's, that's fair. I really do think with Coltec as well and these Blizzards, half tracks are going to become so crucial to moving units around and getting them to the front lines. It would be much more important. Yeah, that's, that's definitely the case. Half-tracks, obviously, also, uh, your units will no longer be affected by the cold inside a half-track, so that's why they're so critical. I agree with you, Hans. I think given that players are aware of it, it becomes a tactical decision, something they can use to their advantage, something they can use to their opponent's disadvantage, uh, rather than it being just a random event which could have you know a massive impact on the game. Um, what else struck you from the uh, the playtest, Stefan? Was there anything that you particularly enjoyed? Well, with regards to the cold tech again. Um, with regards sure. to anything, really. Well, with the cold tech, um, I don't like the campiness of it. I already voiced my opinion about that. There's a, but it's better than the pre, the other version that we played at Eurogamer. There's like a little uh, timer thing, or. There's a little indicator which shows how cold a unit is and when they're going to start losing health and losing men. And there's this uh, voice that says, the blizzard is coming soon. The blizzard is over now. So that was much better. It tells you and lets you know when a blizzard's going to be coming. Um, I like that, but at the same time, I think maybe they could change the blizzard system entirely. Like, they've already decided they're going to have this blizzard system in the game, yeah. It's like, the, the you know, the Russian front... It was very cold. They need the blizzard system in the game, but maybe for the bl when the blizzard's on, it, it won't reduce unit health, or it won't make them just die out, because that's going to stop flanking and things like that. Maybe it just reduces everyone's accuracy, makes everyone do less damage, so fights are longer or something like that. Yeah, that's an interesting, interesting idea. Um, what about playing the game itself? I know that you played. Uh... Uh, almost exclusively 1v1s, whilst I was yeah. getting uh, getting fairly thoroughly owned by Tommy and Hans in 2v2s. <laughs> so what did you think, uh, which which side did you prefer, uh, and which units did you really enjoy? I liked the Soviets a lot. Uh, making a lot of conscripts at the start reminded me about how uh, how the Americans are played out, very aggressive play. They're made out from the HQ as well, the conscripts, like the Panzer Grenadier style of things. Except they're a bit weaker, but they were a lot fun to play. I played most of the maps on the um, the Blizzard map, so I got a, you know, a fair feeling of how that feels. Um, but it was fun. I just wanted to keep playing. Keep like keep practicing, keep playing. I was I, I was had this strategy that I thought of from Eurogamer, just making loads of conscripts and katushas, because katushas were so good at Eurogamer. They got toned down a bit for uh, when we played it this time. So I discovered this this monster of a tank, the SU-87 or whatever. Three shots of a tank, it cost really cheap. So I was just conscripts, that tank, every game, easy wins. Um, I'm not sure if it's going to be toned down now in the alpha. <clears throat> if it's not, I'm going to be making that every game. I just wanted to keep playing, and that's a good thing, because when I felt that with the original Company of Heroes, I wanted to keep on playing more and more and more, find out what's overpowered, find out what I can use in order to beat my opponent, and while having fun at the game at the same time. So there's still that aspect of the game 
and that's a very fun aspect, and they've kept that in the game. Yeah, I think it's true that for all the negative things we do say, guys, all of us really thoroughly enjoyed it and wanted to have you know, the whole rest of the day to play. We really didn't want to leave when they started throwing us out. Uh, we wanted to keep on playing. What were your, your favorite moments, Hans, other than losing your elephant tank to ice? Um, I swear, make, uh, Germans can build a howitzer now, which is awesome, as well as this massive like packing placement. It is it, against Sefer's SUs, it was like two showing them almost. It was so useful. However, it wasn't uh, my one wasn't really supported that well, so it got overrun and then got contusion mm. quite quickly. But yeah, that gun was so sick, and I loved all the the yeah, the tank treads as you ran through, and um, you could see where the tanks had been. It looked really, really good. Well, that's another thing they had that was new to the cold tech. Is in the snow you have persistent tank treads, so it's always visible where a unit has been. It's uh, something that allows you to see uh, perhaps your you didn't know that your opponent had a light vehicle or a tank, and you can see the tank tracks by the spacing and the size of them. You can roughly tell how much AT you're going to require uh, and, and react to that. With dirt, or is it just on the blizzard maps when the snow's, the snow's around? I didn't notice. I think it was an aspect of the cold tech. Did you notice hands? Because I know that we played on the non-cold map a few times. Sorry, what was that? The persistent tank traps. Did you notice if yeah. they were just on cold maps? or? Uh, yeah, I think they were just on cold. I didn't see any tracks. On, I wasn't really looking for the tracks on the summer maps, to be honest. Yeah, I believe they were just on the cold maps, just like the the footprints as well. That were just uh, they just came up when when there was snow. So where where sorry where where did you guys uh, actually get up to in terms of in terms? Of uh, we were just maps? discussing the things that we most enjoyed about the uh, oh, about the experience. I see, I see. So the, the good, the bad, and, and the ugly. <laughs> Something like that, yeah. So, what if, I mean, obviously you have to, uh, you have to look at not only the rosies, but also any potential thorns in the build that, uh, that we played. So what kind of stuff did make you maybe, maybe cringe and think, that's, that's not good. What do you think, Razor? Um, I think they've been discussed, really, sort of the, uh, the potential for a more static gameplay with the cold tech is definitely a real concern for competitive multiplayer. Um, I wanted, I want to say one thing. I really loved the design of both armies. I really think that the unit composition of both armies was such a mixture. You don't have a defensive, you don't have an offensive team. It's not like US and Vermac. The US is constantly attacking the Vermax defending until they get up there. You know, later techs. Both sides had. Strong early game potential. They could rush light vehicles. They could go into a heavier tech. They could go with a uh, defensive weapon crew style. They could. They both had really good late game. They seemed like they were really consistent throughout the whole game. And I think that's a really interesting dynamic. I think that both players could end up rushing like M8s or ACs against each other, or both players could end up, you know, building AT guns in preparation for that. I think that's. I think that's an interesting dynamic, and I think that's one of the things that I liked best about it. Okay, so Sefa, if you could if you could summarize just in a few words the good, the bad and the ugly for you based on the build that we played. Well, coming back to what you said, a thorn in the side of the game, I think the game is really good. The actual game, the gameplay is fine. It's fun. It's fresh. There's a lot of new dynamics like mirror matches, cold tech. Cold tech can be adjusted. That's no problem. You know, if it's, if it's underpowered or overpowered or there's something wrong with it, and that can be fine, that's fixed. But what I'm afraid of is the stuff that's happening outside of the game at the moment. Like the stuff in, do you get the customization, the preparation for the game, like commanders, like bulletins, and things like that. Are we going to have a system that was like Company of Heroes Online, where players are going to be paying for all the good stuff? Like, it's going to be a pay to win situation. I know they've said. No, it's not going to be a pay-to-win situation. But from what I've, we've experienced and what we've seen so far, I mean, I'm looking at this bulletin's image. It's like plus 20% more penetration or plus 10% more health or repairs and things like that. I don't like that. How it's going to be, how games could potentially be decided before the game even starts. Like, what if someone wants to go um, armored company? The other player picks armored penetration completely, and he's gone maybe infantry, the armoured player is going to get overwhelmed. 
completely. So that's why I don't like about the game. I think it could be a thorn in the side of Company of Heroes 2, and that's the kind of like like this design at the moment. It doesn't seem like it can be changed. Like it can't be balanced. It seems like it's already been decided that relic with relic that this is the way we're going to go. This is what we're going to do. We've already designed this. We've already done all the graphics, the user interface, and so and such on and so forth. Um, that's worry, one of the big worries that I have. Okay, so I mean, I I share a lot of a lot of your concerns uh, myself as well. But Hans, uh, anything to you? If you were to sum up your overall feeling. Um, in, in a few words, you know, what, what is your overall impression coming away from, from playing? Um, again, like Razor said from Eurogame, a very, very positive. Um, I just think, there are, obviously there are a few nicks and things that could be improved and there are problems, but hey, they can always be fixed out in patches and even the Intel bulletins, although that might be a bit of a problem, I'm sure after doing all this balance testing and everything, every, uh, they'll um, manage to get a good kind of Kind of thing going, so we it will get. Um, that's what I'm looking for: balanced matches, and uh, so everything's even and fair. So I'm just yeah, positive from from this experience. Okay, so we're now going to head into the second part of our little of our of our round table here, um, which is going to be a Q and A with uh, with you guys in the chat. I can see there's almost 400 of you now watching, and um, well, with with the uh, with the NDA on information at least pretty much down, we will try and answer any questions anyone has. Anything that you really wanted to know about, maybe the feeling of the game or particular units or anything like that. If you want to know it we will try and answer as best you can. So if anyone has any questions, leave them in the chat and we will try and uh, get back to you. Although I think a lot of you guys are probably downloading your, your code to alpha as soon as possible and just, just going to be switching off this broadcast the moment that, that you get it. So the first question we have from Jeep is, uh, Razor, do you intend to grow a beard like Gandalf's? <laughs> uh, well, I think I'd have to be a bit older to have a beard like Gandalf. Uh, I don't think I'm going to grow grey anytime soon, or even white. Uh, so I, I've had this for about 10 years now, and I don't really have any intentions of, of growing it any longer. <laughs> Maybe people could donate uh, and build me a new PC. <laughs> Alright, so we we got some real questions coming in now. So um, what about anti-cheat systems is something that Winans has come through with. Um, I'll take this one. It's just that we don't know a whole lot about what the anti-cheat will consist of exactly. All we know is that it's going to be coming through Steam. So uh, you, so it would be safe to assume that you got stuff like Valve anti-cheat backing it up. I'd say it's probably going to be um, more stringent and certainly heavier potential punitive action will be taken against convicted cheaters. So I, I wouldn't worry too much about that, at least at this point. Uh, the next question that we have is... Um, well, the next real question that we have... Blah, 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 blah. Can I... Uh, yeah, if you spot a question... White, White Flash has been dying to ask about uh, mapping and modding. He, didn't want, he really wants to know if there's anything on that. I couldn't I really can. remember that much. I can take that. I spoke specifically to Quinn Duffy in an interview and asked him about that. I said, I don't expect you to answer because we haven't had a proper answer yet. Is there going to be modding? Is there going to be mapping? He said, yes, there is. Yes, there is. There's going to be the tools released as similar to COH1 after the retail. They will release the tools a little bit afterwards. So yes, White Flash, you will be able to make maps. And yes, people, you will be able to mod the game. You will be able to do all kinds of crazy things. And just to add on to the back of that, Trial Bob was actually on the forums, either on GR or on Code2.org, and he actually confirmed that there will be a world builder released along with the game, although perhaps not at, at the launch. So don't worry, there will be the ability for modding and all that kind of good stuff. Can vehicles be hijacked is another question. Seth, do you want to field that one? They can be hijacked, but out of about... 10, 15 vehicles, I only saw one vehicle that was able to get hijacked. So they can be hijacked, but I think they'll be able to be hijacked very rarely. And I'm not sure if they can be hijacked by regular infantry squads or engin just engineer squads, because I didn't have much experience of doing it. They can be hijacked by regular uh, infantry squads, if I remember okay. correctly. Um, so Hans, here's a question that I will send to you. How does the Wehrmacht, although of course it's not the Wehrmacht, it's the Ostheer. How does the Ostheer veterancy work? Is it viable? It's not viable. You earn it. It's like um, 
it's like playing as the US or the Panzer Elite. You will, uh, um, when you kill units, you get your veterancy like that. You, you can't buy a veterancy in this time, this time round. However, the teching, I will say, the teching is like the original Wehrmacht, where you buy, it, you upgrade it at your main base, your HQ. Okay, so teching similar uh, to regular COH, but oh, veterancy oh, is earned. Austria, they get XP by killing units, right? Because I, I thought the Soviets got XP from um, being simply being in combat and firing at stuff. So with the Austria, Austria they have American veterancy this time. Uh, as I understand it, the yeah, the Soviets gain experience from simply doing damage to yeah. units rather yeah. than having to get the kill. That makes sense. <clears throat> there. Okay, this is a question I'll open up to anyone who can answer it, because it's a rather tricky one. A good question, though. Uh, what about the fog of war? In Vico, you can see RT shooting tanks and ATs moving in the fog of war for a few seconds after they fire. Does anyone have an answer to that? Yeah, I was getting hit by a long-range um, vehicle that was in the fog of war. It was hitting my infantry. So you can, I think you can see units in the fog of war while they're firing. I think that mechanic is still going to be into the game. Okay, so Razor, I'll send you another question, which is how is the sniper handled in terms of visibility, range, and shooting? Um, well, very different to COH1. You're not going to see the kind of sniper spam that we see nowadays. Uh, it's an interesting dynamic because the Soviets have a two-person sniper squad because it can be male or female, and the austere only have a one-man sniper squad at the moment. Uh, which I'm not sure how that's going to work out in terms of the sort of counter sniping dynamic, because I tried to counter snipe a Soviet sniper squad, and I shot the guy with my sniper, and immediately got shot by the other one, uh, <laughs> which wasn't the wasn't the best best idea I've ever had in my life. Uh, but they have yeah they have pretty good um, pretty long ranges. They're immune to the cold, which is very significant in cold maps. Um, they only camo when in cover and not moving. That's a massive deal. That's a great obviously, change. Yeah, I think everyone agrees it's a great change. And that was one of the things that Quinn said they'd taken on board from uh, CH one Things camoing in the middle of the open is a bit, a bit yeah. stupid. Uh, I think they're mostly going to be, they're going to be much more specialized now. I think they're just going to be for taking out weapon crews. Um, they're not really going to be like picking off infantry left, right and center and dancing back. Uh, because they need to have a better line of sight now. They need something scouting ahead to give them line of sight and if they're shooting, if they're moving, if they're doing pretty much anything, they're not camoed. They're only camoed if you leave them static in cover, like uh, Falshrooms. Okay, so the next question we have, we've got quite a lot of people asking about air power. How is air power going to be handled? Hans, do you have an answer to that? Air power? Well, I did notice there is some, there's quite a few abilities for both sides to call in some kind of airstrike and stuff, and I didn't really have any chance to try and see if any of my units could shoot these units down but um, I'm sure there are and um, we we'll just have to wait and see because we didn't get to really try that out in the multiplayer testing I don't think okay um, we have another question which is will you be able to stream um, the COH2 pre-alpha I'll just tell you that now to anyone who's watching no you cannot the NDA whether you read it or not uh, which you signed, whether you realized it or not, does not allow you to, to stream the uh, or shoutcast the, the pre-alpha stress test at this point. And I think Lynx was in the chat just a minute ago and announced that that will be made open uh, to shoutcasting and stuff like that when the when the actual beta, the, the closed beta, goes live after the, after the new year in 2013. So for now, no, do not go away and stream Company of Heroes 2, otherwise you will find a very angry THQ PR department on your doorstep. So another question um, we have, has the garrison mechanic improved? As in, can you see firing arcs and blind spots? Can you control facing inside a structure? Does anyone have an answer to that? Yeah, the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is the garrison mechanic is... I'd say identical in my experience of it. Um, although the maps we played on were fairly uh, rural in nature, so there weren't that many buildings, and the buildings were mostly used just to prevent uh, freezing to death. They were on the flanks mostly, especially on the Blizzard map I played. Um, they were in strategic positions over the victory points, but I didn't notice many buildings. Uh, 
otherwise on the maps and the building mechanic is pretty much the same as in Company of Heroes, which is a good thing to be honest. Okay. Now we've got a more sort of metagame based question here. With infantry feeling weaker, will vehicles come to dominate the metagame? Does uh Hans do you do you have any kind of uh, response to that? I think vehicles, yeah, vehicles I think are gonna be much more useful than actually infantry because vehicles don't suffer from the the cold other than falling into ice. Um, uh, yeah, so I think they would be much more prominent in this in Company Heroes 2 rather than Company Heroes in the original, purely because they just don't get affected by the blizzards, blizzard as much as infantry do. Okay. Uh, one question that's been asked a couple of times, so I better answer it, is uh, will Soviets be a more defensive faction if they vet just by doing damage? And in, uh, in combination with that, if we could also answer the question about how trenches are going to work uh, with regards to the Soviet faction. Uh, Razor, do you want to uh, throw a reply to that one? Um, sure. In terms of the Soviets being defensive, no. I don't think so. I think there's the potential maybe to play them as a more defensive faction, but they have, they, I think the way that all of us played them, they have such a, a powerful early game with the conscripts who can upgrade Molotov cocktails, for example, which are just awesome. Um, and uh, I personally enjoyed using the Scout car, which is a very early vehicle, a little bit like a sort of bread and carrier thing, except that uh, you just chuck a Flamer Engineer squad in and drive around in circles and burn everyone. And then I teched up to the, what I called the Clown car, which is the T-70, sort of medium tank thing, uh, which was amazing. It was literally <laughs> the best thing ever. Built two of them and just ran around in circles for the whole game. So I think they've got they they probably could be played defensively, but I think we all think that they they're best played offensively, um, and they're much better as a sort of go, going forward faction uh, with light vehicles and and harassment. And Seth, what did you make of uh, the defensive structures that were available to both factions? Because they that had changed a little bit the way that they've implemented those. I didn't have too much experience looking at them. I know the. Ostia can still make a usual MG bunker. They can now make a healing bunker at the base. Um, they can make a different kind of bunker that gives reinforcements. Um, but with the um, the balance in terms of late game and early game, I think both armies they're going to have an equal amount of camping ability, and they're going to have an equal opportunity to win the game throughout the entire game. You know, usually it was the Americans they were fighting a lot of early game, they were trying to do as much damage as possible and the Wormack were camping most of the time. Now I think both armies are going to have an equal amount of opportunity, an equal amount of uh, units and abilities with which to camp, with which to be aggressive with um, and they're gonna be more effective at all phases of the battle instead of one's more effective at this stage and one's less effective at this stage. Okay. So we have another question uh, which a lot of people want to know about, which is a good question actually. How do the criticals work in COH2? Is there side penetration in addition to front and back? And uh, what kind of extra extra criticals do we have? Razor, you're nodding your head. How about you take this one? Um, I mean, yeah, this uh, the build we played, the sort of numbers on criticals are a bit different. For example, Fausts were acting like sort of sticky bombs uh, and doing damaged engine pretty much every single time. I'm not sure if that's going to stay. Um, in terms of the criticals, you have the same sort of criticals. You have main gun destroyed, you have damaged engine, you have destroyed engine, you have immobilized. Um, the main new critical thing, I think, is going to be the fact that very rarely, um, from what we saw, when a unit is killed, it can actually be sort of decrewed. Uh, the vehicle stays intact, it can be decrewed, and then a small number of infantry from either side can recrew it, and it sort of pops up on on one percent life um, and you can go and repair it if you're if you're able to get there before it's taken out okay cool so the next question we have is how are base buildings going to work how are units produced from base buildings Hans what is your answer to that question basically um, when you want to build a unit it comes from off the map it doesn't come out of the building itself so there are certain rally points off the map and Razor uh, kept on uh, talking about the point that if you captured a certain territory you can call in units from even one 
one quarter of the map on the other, say if you had your base on the other side, you can call it right from the other side of the map if you had this territory secured. So it's much more different to the, the original Company Heroes with um, how units are produced now. And that might be um, slightly imbalanced or a bit unfair at some points if um, with the capturing a strategic point from the corner of the map and bringing units on like that. Okay. So we've now got I've uh, got a couple of quick questions I can probably answer myself. How do you steal tanks and dynamics? So far, there's no kind of fancy climbing all over the tank, diving down the turret animation. You uh, you just go up to it, you right click on it, and and you warp inside. That's how it works currently. Um, can you win by camping and RTing the enemy? Well, when there's a blizzard, there is a bit of a tendency to kind of sit back with the, with the fires. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I think that's really something that's only that's only going to become apparent um, a little bit later on. Another question I can answer very quickly: flamethrowers is effective on vehicles. The answer is, well, no. Uh, flamethrowers do not work on vehicles. I think the only game I played where they actually did was there was one game I played, uh, an RTS game, World War Two one, where you could use flamethrowers to heat up tanks, and then the crew bailed out, and then you could steal it. It was great, but. Um, well, uh, another question here: Can artillery destroy base buildings? Seth, can artillery destroy base buildings? I did not use any artillery on base buildings, uh, to be honest with you. I know, I noticed that base borings are a bit. They look a bit more visually boring now. Like they look very similar. It's going to be hard to tell the difference between base buildings when you first start playing the game. They're kind of stuffed into the ground, and they're not actual proper building buildings like they were in Company of Heroes 1 but base buildings are same. I think they have a bit more HP so they might be harder to kill so you won't get artillery one-shotting like a Krieg barracks or something like that in the game now okay so uh, so Razor tell us um, how we got people asking about the the way that the territory system has now changed there are now fewer strategic points to capture on the field as they used to be. How do you think, if if any way, that's gonna that's gonna change things? Uh, it's difficult to say. It really is. Uh, obviously, fewer points. There'll be fewer points to cap. There'll be fewer points to fight over. Uh, it might concentrate the fighting around the frontline points more. Or alternatively, it might mean that people are you know just capping a small number and then sitting back. It's it's. It's very difficult to say. One thing I will say is that the, the resource layout on maps is going to be divided into two different types of maps. Uh, one called Frontline, which is designed for competitive players, is going to be more symmetrical, uh, is going to be balanced and changed purely based on competitive play. And the other called uh, Battlefield, more asymmetrical, um, more designed for the gentlemen who like to play comp stomps um, or annihilation games, things like that, less to do with competitive play. And those, um, I think Quinn described them as having different tactical elements. <laughs> Very diplomatically put there. Um, yeah. Will Russians be shot when they retreat in multiplayer? Well, this is an easy question to, uh, to answer. Um, no, they won't. Um, although, um, that is something that uh, could be rolled out into a potential campaign, but I don't think it's very feasible as a multiplayer aspect, and it wasn't in there either. Uh, map scouting, is it different considering the fog of war hands? How did you handle scouting when you were playing in your 1v1s and 2v2s? Yeah, so I normally sent my infantry forward as kind of the into the meat grinder so that my tanks in the back can then take out the... Uh, the armor in front, and, they, and his tanks didn't have line of sight on mine, so I normally would send my infantry forward. I didn't really, um, I didn't really notice any light, like recon vehicles, other than half tracks for the, uh, for the Verma, for the Ostia, sorry. So um, I don't know how that's going to work out. Well, the um, the Russians though, they had um, their own little cheap scout cars that they can make out of the second building, so they had the ability to rush in. Um, the scout union, so they could. I don't know if that's unfair or what. What do you think about that? Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I found scouting to be. I gotta say, when I was playing in the 2v2, 
I didn't personally notice the the true sight mechanics quite so much as I thought I would. When I played the pre-alpha at Eurogamer, it was a very urban environment, and I really noticed it. There were fences that were very deliberately, obviously, placed by the map maker for that purpose to make it really, really noticeable that there was true sight, and that did really open up new avenues of flanking. It really did. Um, but when I was playing in the big two v twos on these fairly open maps and maps where there are large sort of swathes of just open country, you don't know notice that true sight quite so much and it feels a lot yep. more like regular COH. So that is to bear in mind and of course during during uh, Queen Delphi's presentation to us on Thursday he spoke about the different kind of locales that you're going to be fighting in and this goes from uh, sort of industrial ones, more like along the lines of Sturzdorf, to to more kind of uh, to more urban ones with with lots of buildings and things, and then also very open ones. And of course, the very open ones, you're you're not really gonna notice that true sight, and and the the scouting mechanics are gonna be fairly fairly similar to how they are. And then the unit forward, they have a look around, you run back. So, if I might uh, add quickly, yeah, sure. uh, I did notice the effect of smoke on the true line of sight system. There was one, you guys were playing a game, and one tank sort of got blown up in a large armored engagement. And the smoke coming off the wreck then blocked the line of sight of the tanks behind that. Uh, and I think there was also a, one of the commander abilities was dropping smoke from an aircraft, and that could be used obviously to block line of sight if you were making an attack or making a retreat. Uh, if someone was sort of you know, moving in on you, you could drop smoke and they wouldn't be able to see as well, and you could maybe reposition on their flank. Or if you were attacking and you didn't want to take too much damage from AT guns and such, maybe drop the smoke around the AT guns and then rush your tanks past them. Uh, so I think the smoke actually, that, that was sort of the most obvious thing, because there was a very obvious graphical thing slap bang in the way. Uh, so I noticed it then the most. Okay, so another question is, is the unit health similar to COH1? Well, I will say, from, from playing it both at Eurogamer and in this, in this later, more, more sort of uh, alpha, later on in the alpha build, unit health seems to be relying a lot less on criticals for infantry. You would very rarely, or I didn't see it at all, any, any moments where a squad would you know, run forward and, and the opposite squad sitting in cover would headshot two guys with the first two rounds. Damage seems to be a lot more consistent, so when uh, the vehicle that everyone will recognize as the PE armored car rolls out, and the vehicle <laughs> that you kind of associate with unadulted rape, uh, it doesn't come along and just annihilate a whole squad in, in three seconds. That didn't happen. So in that regard, health works similarly, but the criticals on the infantry seem to have been toned down a bit. Another question we have here, Russian sniper team. If one sniper drops, will the remaining one be able to counter snipe or does it only act as a scout? Does anyone have actually an answer to that? It's hard to say, really. When I, as I say, when I counter sniped a uh, Russian sniper, I immediately was shot by the other person. But I don't know if they're divided into one is the recon person, one is the gunman, or if they switch roles when one of them dies. I, I, I don't think we tested it enough to to give a definitive answer on that. Okay. Um, yeah, I can't remember it too well myself. It would be interesting because obviously if you shoot, if you tell a sniper right now to target a specific man on an MG squad, for example the gunner, he will shoot the gunner. So it makes sense if you could shoot the guy holding the sniper rifle and just be left with an unarmed spotter. That would that would kind of make sense. Um, but I, I don't remember that and that's something that uh, that will have to be tested uh, by you guys in the pre-alpha once you're in. I think i uh, getting some messages now that the, that the keys have sort of run out rather quickly um, but hopefully they'll be letting wow. more people uh, more people in as it goes on. Uh, another question here regarding units. Are there Panzer 2s or Panzer 3s in the game? Razor, I know you have an extensive uh, list of units. Are there any Panzer 2s or Panzer 3s on there? Um, I'm afraid yeah. not. No, I've got a full list of the Ostia units. They were um, in the Eurogamer build, though, if I remember right. There was a Panzer three in the Eurogamer, but they yeah. weren't in the build that we played this time. Ooh. Probably belonged to Commander. I think there was a yeah. Panzer four. There was a Panzer four. Yep. There yeah. was uh, Stugs, Ostwind, Panzer four, Panzer Werfer, rocket launcher, Sturm Panzer four, Panther, Elephant, uh, Scout car pack, two fifty one half track. No, I'm afraid, afraid no Panzer 2s or 3s. 
Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna come up to uh, to the wrapping up time now and let these three guys and myself get away and actually play the game as much as we all want to. I know we're all just kind of <laughs> foaming at the mouth slightly, um, but let's just do a few quick fire questions. Um, so, favorite unit, Hans' favorite unit, elephant tank. That thing is a beast. And why why was it your favorite? Because it was it, even though it was like a a marder. I know everybody hates marders. And original car but it had so much armor it looked like a king tiger and it would it had the biggest penetration right it would literally take out any kind of armor but you just needed it you needed to support it though well of course because your one your one fell through the ice didn't it yeah <laughs> <laughs> never again hopefully oh dear okay uh, and what was your what was your least favorite unit what unit uh, or did you least like facing uh, the Katusha because it's so bloody overpowered <laughs> at the moment <laughs> I think your sentiments may be I shared. <laughs> um, so, Razor, favourite and least favourite unit? Uh, my favourite's got to be the T-70, the clown car. Uh, it felt like uh, an M8 sort of thing, and I loved that sort of light vehicle harassment, dr driving things round and round in circles, sniping out infantry. Uh, least favourite? Oh, I don't know. I, I, mortars, actually. They're Quinn Duffy's favourite unit, but they were my least favourite unit, because when I was playing yourself and Hans, I think one of Hans's mortars took out about five or six weapon crews and oh, a tank. Yeah. Ouch. They were all clumped together, though. <laughs> <laughs> and Seth, favourite and least favourite unit to you? Uh, favourite unit, conscripts. Oorah. I'm going to have fun playing with them early game. Oorah spam. Spamming Oorah around, yeah. Okay. Um, least favourite unit, I don't think I have one. Maybe Katushius. Because they're artillery, and I don't like um, full artillery dynamic. But... They did fire an awful lot of rockets. I got to say, I mean, the barrage yeah. lasted for a the good, you know, 15 seconds or so. So it's it's not like it's not like a Cali where you know even if it's in a really nasty place, you can sort of be like, it's it's okay, it's over now, it's over after about five seconds. You have to you you have to move your move units away from a Kadusha barrage because it will last forever. Eventually, it will kill something. Um, I, I foresee some balance problems with that unit in the future. It'll take maybe a year or so to balance out. It's tough. I mean, you know, re relic, relic. Um, yeah, we did eventually get balance for Co One. Only took <coughs> six years, but it's fine. We will, uh, I'm sure, with such a lengthy beta process, and you know, knowing everything that we know now about how COH works and how it plays, I would imagine that the game is going to be balanced far, far quicker than it, yeah. than it was with the original. Well, possibly. I mean, what Quinn said in his presentation was that he didn't want it to be a two or three unit meta game, but from what I've seen so far, it looks like it's going to be a two, three, maybe four unit meta game for the next year or one year and a half. Eventually, they'll get that balance there balance all the units out to the stages that we see in Company of Heroes 1 and there'll be a lot more options but for now it's going to be yeah a couple of units are going to be in every game I foresee okay so we're going to let uh, we're going to let you three guys go and myself and go and play the oh. alpha we hope that there are some guys in the chat there who are going to Once. join us yep Hans what's up before um, everybody rushes off I just can I just link the uh, I've just put up a post for all the videos and video footage that I took from uh, the event. So if anybody is interested in that, please go check it out. Okay, so you heard it here. You can go and check out, I think it, that's Queen Duffy's presentation, as well as some gameplay of, of me and Seth playing and, and some cool stuff in there. So, um, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed our little roundtable chat. Hopefully that has helped out some of you guys, especially the guys that didn't quite make it, who weren't quite fast enough on the old F5 button to uh, to actually get into the pre-alpha yet, but don't worry. I think uh, that there will be more opportunities to get into it, and even if there aren't, there is the, uh, the close beta just around the corner. So thank you guys for watching. Uh, we got something like 400 viewers, which is pretty nice, and uh, don't forget to tune in to the actual Sunday Night Fights, which is going to be this Sunday at 8 o'clock. That's going to be uh, the third qualifier tournament for Sunday Night Fights, so it's going to be some really good games on there. Don't miss that, and uh, we will see you next time. See ya. Thank you.